So hi guys, I wanted to first just take one quick second and say thank you so much Haney for putting on this conference. It's so fresh and exciting and I've already had residents come up to me and say it's been the best day of lecture all year. So hopefully we can continue that way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I'm here today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about managing your team during a cardiac arrest. So I'm not going to talk to you about CPR, and I'm not going to talk to you about ACLS, or when to intubate these patients, when to get the ultrasound on, their, on them, and how to do that. We've already had some of those talks, and I'm sure a lot of you in the audience may even know more than I do about that. Um, what I am going to talk to you is how to best try to optimize our teams so that the team dynamics are not what we're fighting against when we're trying to translate all this knowledge we have into actions that may save lives. So let me first start off by asking, how many of you have been involved in a cardiac arrest patient? Yeah, come on, it should be pretty much everyone. Now, how many of you have been involved or maybe even run of a really successful cardiac arrest? Dr. Bree Wheeler, your hand should be up. You did it yesterday. <laughs> um, so how many of you have been involved in a cardiac arrest that maybe didn't go so smoothly? And maybe we were even left feeling like we could have done a little bit better for our patients. I'll let you know a secret, I might have run a couple of those cardiac arrests. <laughs> so what is it that makes these differences in the teams that do really well during cardiac arrest versus a team that, that just can't figure out how to get their footing? So I think one of the things that we need to learn a little bit more about is team dynamics and how to kind of lead and manage these teams in the most efficient way to optimize them. We need to do that in these very stressful situations when literally sometimes life is on the line. So you can imagine that any flaw that could come out in a normal set of team dynamics is only going to be amplified in these situations. I think that, that for me that's why I feel it's particularly important to be really true to who you are and who you feel comfortable being as a leader when you're in these situations. It's really hard if you're kind of a boisterous, loud person to suddenly become the person who's running a silent code room. And I think it's really hard if you're kind of a quieter, more reserved person to suddenly take control. So I had a resident, we'll call him Jon Snow. <laughs> he was very hardworking and, and uh, you know, did a great job running resuscitations, but he's also kind of more of a quiet, introspective type guy. He, he ran a code with a wolf, obviously, but also he, he ran a, a, a code that was very, very quiet. Over his time during residency, he'd learned that what he needed to do to gain control of the room was to ask for his team, sometimes repeatedly, to be quiet. He was very good at, at uh, still being kind of direct and assertive, but did frequently remind people that the room needed to stay quiet. I've only just met all of you, but you might imagine I'm not a quiet person. I'm kind of large and loud. It would be very, very hard for me to run that same kind of code. I've admitted that sometimes I don't run great codes, but I hope that I've honed my skills so that the number of times that that's happening are very few and far between. And I think that my successes lie in some of the things that both John and I do, that do similarly in codes. So what do I think those things are? So when you're managing your team, I think that that means that you need to be being uh, prepared. I think you need to uh, be yourself, but maybe a little bit better. <laughs> I think you need to own your leadership role and kind of hold on to that role. And I think you need to kind of maintain your focus and make sure that these little successes don't kind of get us off track. So let's break that down a little bit. So the first thing you need to do that we said that both John and I do uh, is to prepare your team. What I think that means is very specifically addressing who's going to be part of your team and what your specific roles and expectations are for those people. People want to be a success. They want to be a success in your code. And they need to know what you want from them in order to be able to do that. I know that this is a, can be a really daunting task, especially to a junior resident who has to come into the room and maybe tell one of their seniors to you know, get to the head of the bed, or maybe tell me <laughs> to step away. <laughs> um, I understand that. And so it's a very uh, kind of daunting task. The way I think we can maybe work towards making it a little bit more comfortable is try to be friendly. <laughs> try to introduce yourself when it's necessary and just be very direct about what you expect from your team. 
answer. Uh, I think it's really important that we take um, you know, wh who we are in those leadership roles and carry that through who we are in the emergency room every day. You're not gonna suddenly step into the room and get to rip off your Superman cape and, and now you're the hero, right? Who you are and how you've prepared your team in the ED every day is gonna carry through into who you are in a code. When you step into a room, it's been shown in studies that the, all of the preconceived notions about who you are as a physician come right with you. So if you're the doc that none of the nurses like and the respiratory therapists can't stand to try and talk to you, that's gonna follow you in there too, unfortunately. It's hard to kind of manage those, the balance the idea of being both uh, you know, a strong and assertive leader without coming across sometimes as unfriendly but again, I think this can go back to really basic things. You want to introduce yourself when it's necessary. I think this is particularly important when you're running a code and now you've maybe needed to ask for help. Right? You may need to say, hey, we're not getting this lining. Can someone call a surgeon to do help from this? And down comes the head of surgery. So, hi, doctor head of surgery. I'm Erin. I'm the code leader. What I'd I, we're having some trouble gaining IV access on our patient. Can you please come assist my colleague in trying to gain that access? What you've done there is you were friendly and assertive. You introduced yourself. You very specifically laid out for them how they could be successful in your code. We all want to be a success, and now they know how they can do it for you. This also will hopefully uh, keep you in the leadership role and uh, make them think twice before they kind of try to step in and, and uh, take some of that leadership away. Um, that's important because there are multiple studies that show that the main place where our codes move, uh, lose momentum is when we have these sort of leadership changes. Your team chose you, and now you have this hardworking team, and they like you, and they want to do well for you, so stay in that role. Sometimes, as a junior resident, that can be particularly hard as you're getting to watch your, your friend get to place the awesome chest tube or get to put in the central line, but it's really important. That also means understanding who's around you, what their capabilities are, and when you need to ask for more help if it's available. Again, this is, uh, can be a very difficult task as a junior resident, and so sometimes it may even mean turning to your attending and say, I would like this done. How do I get it done? It's okay. It's important as a leader to realize also where you may need extra help. Now we have our patients and we're coding them so well and your team actually has a success and you're, you're, you know, you've got back a pulse. What now? Well, it's really important once you've caught that wave and you're riding down it that you don't forget that this is what's coming behind you. <laughs> you need to have a plan in place or at least start looking to your colleagues to help you formulate a plan about what happens with these patients next. Uh, it's really important that right after we finish, you know, we get that first palpable pulse back, that we're not high-fiving and everyone goes back to their assignments. We just had a talk where we discussed how important it is that we never let that map even drop again. So it, it's very important that we kind of see these patients through all the way to the end and so that at, we can have a seamless transition to a new leadership team as opposed to these multiple uh, you know, changes that disrupt our, dis our momentum. So please remember, when you're trying to start taking control of more cardiac arrests, to be prepared, be your best self, be the leader, and be present until the end. Thank you.